Welcome to today's lectures. Topic is uh, closed geodesics. Closed geodesics or periodic geodesics. So uh, we already learned what geodesics are. So uh, the setting here is uh, usually that we have a Riemannian manifold or Finsum manifold and we are looking for closed so periodic geodesics so the quest so we are uh, so the goal is to obtain certain existence results for this type of uh, geodesics <coughs> so so it's closed or which is also the same as periodic or periodic geodesics Um, so we are looking for curves gamma, so gamma or z, which are, well this should be a geodesic, so locally shortest curve, we define it by the equation that uh, the covariant derivative of the velocity vector field vanishes. so that means it's geodesic. And uh, so it should be, so it's closed or periodic if uh, it satisfies this periodicity condition for all t. So then you can, can also view this as a map from S1 to M. So this is a closed geodesic, so uh, after time one, the geodesic comes back to its initial point and also the directions at this point are the same. So this is a closed geodesic. There's also the notion of a geodesic loop. So that's a curve which is closed but which the sense is not periodic, so it comes back, so that's called geodesic loop. So the geodesic comes back to its initial point, but with, in general, with a different velocity at this point. <coughs> okay, so, um, so we are looking for geodesics which are periodic, one can also describe them as a uh, it's also the so closed geodesics also a, uh, can also be viewed as a periodic orbit of the so-called geodesic flow periodic orbit of uh, So that's from point of view from dynamical system. So the geodesic flow is a canonical system. So it's defined as follows. So uh, if you start, so you have some tangent vector v, and then there is a geodesic with this initial direction. So that's zv. And you follow this geodesic and uh, at time t you evaluate the velocity vector yeah so the uh, geodesic flows defined as phi t of v is the velocity vector of the geodesic zv at time t so zv is uh, geodesic determined by zv of uh, zero, the velocity at time zero is the vector v. <coughs> so that's a dynamical system on the tangent bundle and uh, you can also view it as a system on, uh, on unit tangent vectors, so the unit tangent bundle or sphere bundle 
<coughs> and then uh, if you have a closed geodesic, this is, means that you have a periodic orbit of this dynamical system. <coughs> Um, one way to describe these closed geodesics for, uh, if you want to study uh, existence questions, is uh, by using a variational principle. So <coughs> you can uh, view these closed geodesics also as critical points. So let's make the next step closed geodesics are critical points of uh, some functional, the energy functional. So that means that uh, you take the energy functional on a space now uh, closed curves, so the free loop space, which we here denote by lambda of m to r. Uh, so that means that given some closed curve, we take uh, the norm squared of the length of the tangent vector on the curve. Sigma, okay. So this is a space uh, or certain completion of the space of a completion. The space uh, of uh, differentiable curves. Uh, smooth curves. The completion of the space, so the H1 maps from, lamp, from the sphere, from the circle into M, so square integrable, or can also be described as absolutely continuous curves. <coughs> so, these, uh, so these are the critical points and uh, <coughs> And uh, this, can be, this one can see as by the first variation of formula, which <coughs> so which somehow describes the derivative of this uh, energy functional. So uh, okay, how should I arrange? Okay, so first variation of formula, that means that we have a one parameter family of closed curves. So S is a variation parameter. And then, uh, so we evaluate the energy of this one parameter family. So if this is our original curve C, is C0, then we take a certain variation of this. So there are one parameter family of curves. And uh, this also defines a variational vector field, so which then is V of t equals yes, dt. No. So the derivative with respect to the variational parameter Time t. So that's the variation of vector field. Here's maybe of this form. And then uh, you can we obtain this formula that's a derivative easy s. So this only depends on uh, actually the variation of vector field. And these variation of vector fields can be seen as a uh, the tangent vectors of this uh, so-called free loop space.
And then it turns out that, so this can be see also written as the derivative of this energy functional on the space in direction of the variation in vector field. And this is given as uh, the inner product of uh, the variation in vector field and the covariant derivative of the velocity vector. So in particular, the critical points are the curves for which this expression vanishes. So these are the geodesics. <coughs> and uh, so the next step, you can also consider the second variation formula. So uh, at the closed geodesic, you can uh, the, you can compute the second derivative. Now Z is a closed geodesic. So at the critical point, you study the second derivative. <coughs> and so this is actually an expression which can be viewed as a Hessian on this free loop space at the closed geodesic Z with respect to V. So if you view this as a quadratic form, <coughs> and this is the integral of uh, the covariant so of the norm of the covariant derivative of the variation vector field minus and then the curvature of the manifold enters. So it's a curvature tensor along this geodesic uh, with uh, respect to the tangent vector and this variation of vector field. So R is a curvature tensor. So from a geometric point of view, this is uh, more or less to the norm, maybe of the vectors. This is a sectional curvature of the plane spanned by the velocity vector and the vector failure to V. <coughs> and, uh, okay, uh, one can rewrite this. Also, so by partial integration, you can write this as uh, so this is, uh, minus plus. Yeah. So you take the derivative of following expression. So V of t covariant derivative of V of t. So if you take, uh, if you differentiate this expression, you get two terms. One term is this, and the other term would be the second derivative of V in a product with V itself. So uh, that means if you integrate it, you have this boundary term minus integral from 0 to 1. Uh, and here it's the second derivative of V dt plus the curvature tensor C prime V V hmm. comma V no no um. Wrong. Uh, 
Um, so let's see. So what do I want to say? So no, it's different. Uh, Okay, uh, sorry. So what's that? So if I take it, so it's R. So V comma Z prime Z prime comma V. So okay, yeah, we can write it like this. DT. <coughs> So there we also have this boundary term. <coughs> okay, so this, this form is also called the index form. Index form. So, uh, so you, one can also ex take the corresponding bilinear form, so this is a quadratic form, so this is uh, then the integral from 0 to 1 from covariant derivative v w dt minus rc c prime v w c prime dt. Uh, the so-called index form and uh, this computation somehow shows that when this expression vanishes that uh, this describes uh, if we have a periodic vector field then uh, this is the so-called the kernel of the space or the uh, the kernel of this index form so uh, this index form is degenerate if uh, these, if there are so-called periodic Jacobi fields. So the Jacobi equation is given by this expression. So the Jacobi fields, which we already uh, discussed when we discussed uh, co comparison results. So Jacobi, the Jacobi field is a, would be a, a vector field such that the second covariant derivative along a geodesic plus this curvature expression equals zero. So that's a Jacobi field. From a geometric point of view, these are variational vector fields of geodesic variations. Variation vector fields of geodesic variations. So if we take a variation by uh, geodesics, and take then the variation vector fields. This is uh, actually a Jacobi field. So if you have a Jacobi field, this corresponds to to the zero space of this index form. So maybe yes. Well, that's a statement that uh, so uh, so periodic. Periodic Jacobi fields they are form the form the zero the null space of the index form. Okay, if we want to use Morse theory with uh, this energy functional as Morse function, 
on this space of uh, on this free loop space then uh, this function is uh, non degenerate if there are no periodic jacobi fields so that's also called uh, bumpy yeah? so a riemannian metric is called bumpy bumpy if there are no periodic Jacobi fields. So if all closed geodesics are non-degenerate, so that means non-degenerate here means that this uh, index form does not have a kernel besides the kernel which comes from the fact that this energy functional is S1 invariant. So if we only change the uh, initial point of the curve, this produces a one-dimensional uh, null space that is, which is always present since the functional is S1 invariant, so invariant under the circle group but uh, if there are periodic if there are so close to your is non-degenerate if there are no periodic Jacobi fields uh, so this is equivalent to the fact uh, there are no periodic Jacobi fields along a Along close to desic. So, uh, in, in classical Mohr theory, you study, for example, uh, differentiable functions on compact manifolds, and then the condition for a Morse function is that these. Uh, function is non-degenerate, which means that the Hessian does not have a kernel. So. And uh, then in classical Mohr theory, you always, you also prove that uh, a generic function is actually satisfies this Morse condition. And uh, a similar statement is true also here. So and that's a statement of the so-called bumpy metric theorem. Uh, which is originally due to Abram. So he, he wrote a maybe three three page paper. But uh, he only indicated a proof that, that was so that was in the 70s and later on Anosov gave a proof, complete proof. Also results by Klingberg and Tarkins were important in this respect. So this bumpy metric theorem states that uh, ZR, where R is at least two generic Oh, that's the that's a statement. So let R be in number at least two. C and then a ZR generic metric. On on a compact manifold. So this is somehow a generic assumption. So this is with respect to a ZR topology. So you measure. <coughs> uh, so the the topology is you use a norm which measures the 
z, the rth derivative of the metric. Um, and so here, generic means that the set of metrics which uh, satisfies this assumption is, uh, can be written as an intersection of, uh, of uh, open and dense sets, infinitely many open and dense sets with respect to this uh, topology. So that's a CR generic property. So since we are on a space of metrics, uh, one cannot state the result like uh, up to or a set of full measure or something like that. But that uh, replaces these conditions. So in some sense, this means that uh, if you pick by accident the metric, it will be bumpy. Certainly, the metrics uh, we would think of usually have symmetries. And if they have a, a group of positive dimension of symmetries, then this uh, assumption is not satisfied. So that's why bumpy, in some sense, means is, uh, the contrast to having symmetries. OK, for this type of metrics, so the, these existence problems are easier to solve. So then the, this energy functional behaves like a Morse function. So uh, there is a so principal problem in this problem. So if you want to detect uh, close to your desk, we are this uh, more theory for the energy functional. And the principal problem is that at close to your desk Z, uh, produces so called a tower of the periodic orb of critical orbits. for the energy function. So what does that mean? Uh, so given a so z is a closed geodesic, you can take the iterates of the curve by going around m times. So then the energy is m squared times e of z. So that's uh, so given one close to your desk, like you get all these iterates. And the other problem is that you have the S1 orbit or actually O2. <coughs> um, yeah. O2, the orthogonal group R2, uh, acts on the free loop space by simply, so what you do is simply change the initial point of the curve and, and uh, you can also change the orientation of the curve. So that's an action of this group, but uh, the energy functional uh, doesn't notice this, so it's invariant. So if you have one critical point, you always have a critical orbit. So one picture could be if this is the energy functional and this is the space, the free loop space. And if you have one critical, so one closed geodesic, then you also have a, so first of all, you have this critical O2 orbit. And then you also have the iterates. So here's C squared also a critical and then the next <coughs> and so on. Well that's why it's called a tower, yeah, if you think in this picture. So what's the principal problem? So one geometric closed geodesic produces infinitely many critical points. 
So if we prove later on the existence of several critical points, we are not sure whether they uh, come from the same geometric, uh, the same closed geodesic, so seen from a geometric point of view. So in, in the free loop space, of these uh, coverings are different, certainly. So the energy function is different. But uh, so geometrically, they could be the same geodesic. So that's a, that's a kind of problem. And uh, one method to overcome this problem is uh, to study the, the so-called the index of uh, of this index form, which then helps to distinguish these critical points or these closed geodesics. So uh, we study the index, the index of a closed geodesic. In Z of a closed geodesic. So uh, the index. So this is uh, this is the index of uh, the index form. So this is uh, the maximal dimension of the subspace on which uh, this index form is negative definite. Maximal dimension of the subspace. Which the index form is negative definite. And uh, okay, so from a geometric point of view, this, this index is related to the number of conjugate points along the geodesic. So, uh, so if we fix, let's say, we fix a point P, Z of zero, so we have a geodesic Z, then, uh, then C of t is called conjugate point. Conjugate point, to be precise, one has to state along which, along the interval from zero to t. Since uh, Okay, this geodesic in general doesn't have to be injective, so to make it unique, you have to add the long which uh, interval. If there is a Jacobi field, along this geodesic, with, which is not non-zero, so the derivative at zero is not zero, but the value at zero vanishes and at this conjugate point vanishes. So in some sense, uh, that's, or sometimes it's called infinitesimal uh, self uh, the point where nearby geodesics infinitesimally intersect the given geodesic. So here we start at this geodesic Z. <coughs> and then, uh, so this means there is a Jacobi field which uh, when is this point and it's this point, then this is a conjugate point. So if you take a variation by geodesics belonging to this uh, Jacobi field, then this means 
So, so not not all of these not all these geodesics have to intersect this given geodesic here, but they intersect infinitesimally in the sense that the corresponding variation of vector field vanishes at this point. <coughs> okay, so uh, <coughs> and if we take if we study uh, the index of uh, the sequence of the indices of a covering of a given closed geodesic, then we count the conjugate points along uh, m periods of these given geodesic. So, uh, so if z is uh, for, if we start this is closed geodesic. Then uh, we can also view this as a periodic geodesic defined on R. So that's the same. Uh, <coughs> and uh, then we use or define the dimension of the space of your Jacobi fields. Jacobi field, so along Z with the property that it vanishes in zero and at time T. So for any parameter value we determine this number then only for a discrete set of values of T this number is positive. And uh, if we sum up, and then, yeah, it turns out at least that the index of the covering is more or less given by the sum of these conjugate points. So if we sum up from time zero up to m. So these are the number of conjugate points which occur before time m. And this index is more or less this number up to a, there's maybe a certain difference given by the dimension of the manifold. <coughs> so uh, these relations are described con more concretely by the so-called uh, Morse index theorem. Okay, what's interesting, what turns out is that uh, these sequence, as a sequence in M, actually behaves almost linearly. And so this defines the so-called average index. So the average index of a closed geodesic is then given as the limit of the index of c to the m over m for m to infinity. So the average index, so it exists, exists. So it's uh, somehow the average number of conjugate points where we count with multiplicity uh, along a period. So that's called the average index. Sometimes we also study the so-called mean average index, which is given simply by dividing out the length, by dividing by the length. So So this can be seen, uh, so this uh, average number of conjugate points after per length unit, this can also be seen as a kind of eigenfrequency. Of 
the closed geodesic. Mm. Um. Okay, yeah, and uh, so this average index actually already occurred in work by Poincaré for, for surfaces and later Hitler. So this general case, and this general case, Raoul Bott gave a so-called formula for this, for this expression index C to the M, from which uh, it follows so it's a general result, but one, one corollary at least is that its average index, uh, that it, yeah, first of all, that it really exists. Uh, so we can get a formula. So let's see, formula. So this applies also to general variational problems of this type. And one conclusion which is important here is that the index of Z to the M actually perhaps linearly, so the difference with M times the average index is bounded by the dimension of the manifold minus one. So this equation inequality holds for all M. And uh, So, if, yeah, if uh, the closed geodesic is hyperbolic, this is so uh, most the most unstable case. So in some senses, it uh, means that Jacobi fields have the tendency to uh, behave exponentially, like in a hyperbolic space. So close then, this uh, relation is particularly simple when it's actually linear. So in this case, so the average index, for example, is an integer, non-negative integer. Okay, uh, how can man define these uh, stability properties? So that's usually done by introducing the linearized Poincaré map. <coughs> so, uh, which do as follows. So it's a, a map on E plus E. So it's a symplectic map on this vector space. E is simply the, so you take the tangent space at that point, 
all right, let's see, at the point of the geodesic and the space which is orthogonal to, to uh, the given di initial direction. And uh, so what you do is you consider Jacobi, Jacobi field. So Y is a Jacobi field. And the Jacobi field is a solution of a second order differential equation. So it's determined by its initial, there are initial values. So, so you take the initial value at the point zero, take the I use this uh, as notation as a covariant derivative, also at the initial point. So these are the initial conditions for the Jacobi field. And then you evaluate this Jacobi field again after one period. Then, so that's a linear map. And uh, it turns out that it's symplectic with respect to the standard symplectic form on this uh, space E plus E. So it's a linear, so it's a linear symplectic map. So, and it uh, measures how Jacobi fields behave. So, uh, and maybe if the particular case, and if we have a surface, so this is just a one dimensional space, Mm. Then either, so if Z is uh, hyperbolic, so that means that uh, the eigenvalues, so eigenvalues, there's means no eigenvalue of PZ has a norm one. So there's no, no eigenvalue of norm 1. And uh, the other point will be if C is elliptic, then uh, any eigenvalue lambda satisfies that the norm is equals 1. <coughs> OK, so uh, what does that mean? So uh, if, if you draw the geodesic like this, so here z of 0, z of 1, z of 2, and so on, then in this case, in the hyperbolic case, there are Jacobi fields which behave like this, so which grow uh, exponentially, so exponential growth. The, uh, the eigenfrequency here, this number, uh, is given by counting, counting uh, these conjugate points up to m and divide this by m. So this, in some sense, is a sort of frequency. So that could be, uh, it could also be that there are no conjugate points. Yeah? In the hyperbolic case of the manifold is, uh, has negative curvature, then there are no conjugate points. Yeah? Then the Kobe fields will go like this. So that will be, uh, so this behavior will, you would find on a manifold for which a section curvature is, well, here it's, the Gauss curvature in for surface is negative. In positive curvature, you also have hyperbolic closed, you can hyperbolic closed geodesics, and so then they have conjugate points, but the, some of the Jacobi fields uh, behave exponentially. What's important in this case, uh, if, yeah, if we also assume that the metric is bumpy, uh, then in the hyperbolic case, this number uh, is irrational. Yeah? So alpha of z is irrational. Whereas in the, no, sorry, it's the other way around, certainly. <coughs> sorry. Uh, 
So, okay, let's see C, hyperbolic. Under the assumption that the metric is bumpy is equivalent to saying that the average index is uh, irrational and Z is elliptic. Oh, it's again wrong, yeah? <laughs> so it's an integer, sorry. And uh, if, if it's elliptic, then it's irrational. So this is true under this assumption that the metric is bumpy. <clears throat> um, so at least for a surface with a bumpy metric, you can distinguish the stability behavior of the closed geodesic using this invariances. <clears throat> okay, and um, okay, then the next step is to use this uh, energy function or uh, it's Morse function, so use energy function. There's a Morse function. So this, uh, and we want to use Morse inequalities, so uh, we want to get inequalities or estimates between the number of critical points of certain index and compare this with uh, the bet a certain Betty number, so topological invariant of this uh, loop space, free loop space. So the invariants which we use here are the following. Mm. Okay, yeah. Let's see, should I do this? Um, yeah, okay. We are, so our metric is bumpy and we then we can uh, write the, the critical points. This energy functional, so which means the closed, which is the same as the closed geodesics can be written as follows as uh, O2 orbits of coverings. So you can write it like this, where J is uh, given in either there are finitely many uh, if there are only finitely many closed geodesics write it like this, and m is some integer. So here also r could be infinite, so we are, we are not sure. But uh, this set is at least discrete, so we can always order these closed geodesics in some sense. And then we count the number of critical points of a fixed index, call this m of k, so that's the number now of numbers m and j such that the index of z j m equals k <coughs> and uh, yeah so we we had this problem with the S1, with this S1 action. And uh, from topological point of view, we can uh, instead use uh, not, uh, the space, the free loop space modulo this S1 action. So in this quotient space, this would, uh, these points would only occur as one point. So the, the topological invariant which we use is BK is a 
Betty numbers of the case Betty number of the free loop space modulo this S1 action. And uh, we have to do this also modulo those so called point curves, so which we can identify with the manifold itself and take certain coefficients, rational coefficients here. So this is a dimension of a certain homology group. This homology group. <coughs> so this is a topological invariant. This is, uh, and the Morse inequalities now, they uh, state that the number of critical points of index k is bounded from below by the k's Betty number. Okay. Oh, so that would be the more inequalities. I would say that m of k is at least b of k. So uh, from point and uh, <coughs> one can also, uh, if you study this uh, in more detail, you can also show that uh, there exists a sequence qk of non-negative numbers such that uh, the number of critical points of index k is given as a k is Betty number plus q k, q k minus one. Mm. And uh, So what that's, this also means is, uh, or you can also write it differently as QK is given by the sum of uh, the alternating sum of the number of critical points. Um, Okay, minus uh, the alternating sum of the critic of the Betty numbers. Okay. <coughs> Okay, maybe later on we'll, we'll use this inequality to get more precise estimates. But first of all, let me give the corollaries or which follow from this simple inequality. So, uh, what I say? Uh, so first of all, if you have this inequality, this Morse inequality, what's immediate uh, is, is immediate corollary, since not all 
since not all BKs vanish, we have as a conclusion the result which originally is due to Birkhoff and later on was stated by Newston, Link and Fiat, which states that there always exists a closed geodesic. So if the manifold, if you have a compact manifold, Actually, this also works for fin symmetrics. Riemannian or fin symmetric. Then uh, there is uh, at least this closed geodesic. So here, closed geodesic means a closed geodesic of positive length, not just the point curve. So to prove this, you have to show that somehow the topology of the free loop space is non-trivial or cannot generate it by point curves itself. So if you want, so this argument only works for bumpy metric, but you can also handle the degenerate case. And uh, now if you now the question is when do there exist maybe infinitely many geometrically distinct closed geodesics? <clears throat> so there what's important is uh, the following statement. Uh, which, uh, let's see. So what you prove is if there are only so uh, the, the the estimate which we already had that the the index of z to the m grows almost linearly implies that uh, this number of critical points of, uh, of uh, index k is bounded by some number z uh, is bounded if this uh, set if r is finite yeah so if there are only finitely many closed geodesics so that uh, comes from the fact that uh, for a, a closed geodesic produces produces uh, one critical point, and what you what we count here as the critical points of a certain index, and by this uh, inequality, uh, it also follows that in a given dimension. So so if you have a given dimension, then only finitely many iterates of these closed geodesic can contribute to this number mk. So that's the important estimate. So one geometric closed geodesic will only, so there are for, for any closed geodesic there is a number which bounds the contribution to these uh, number m of k. So that's an important point. So that means if there are only finitely many closed geodesics that this number m of k is bounded, then also this number b of k is bounded. And so that's a statement of the Gromoll of Gromoll Meyer's the Gromoll Meyer result. So they, that states uh, given a Yeah, for a compact manifold, M for which the sequence of Betty, the sequence uh, Betty numbers of the free loop space.
of the free loop space. is unbounded there are infinitely many geometrically distinct closed geodesics Metric. So this statement, so that's really powerful. It's not only true for this bumpy matrix, but it's actually also true for in the degenerate case in which the, the Moore theory here is more complicated. And you have a certain degenerate Moore theory which you have to handle. And then it's really complicated to prove this statement. Um, okay, so now the question is what this topological condition, whether this is restrictive or not. I mean, here I, I'm somewhat uh, unprecise, since here I took the, the this quotient space, whereas in the original statement it's the, the, uh, they use the Betty numbers of the free loop space without this quotient construction, but actually uh, that doesn't matter here. Uh, or it's, I mean, if, if this number is unbounded, then also this number is unbounded. Um, okay, this assumption is. Uh, in some sense, is satisfied for most top for most manifolds. Yeah. So you can use so-called rational homotopy theory so that's a theory of minimal models, and this shows uh, if the cohomology algebra of the manifold. Uh, or how should I say? Um, yeah. So if uh, the uh, sorry, um, how should I say this? Uh, maybe I should not go too too much into details here. Um, So if uh, uh, the rational homology algebra has several, has uh, more than one generator, then these Betty numbers of the free loop space uh, are unbounded, uh, go to infinity. And so, so the only question is which manifolds only have one generator and that's for example so for uh, the sphere or the complex projective space or hyperbolic projective space these assumptions are not satisfied. So in some sense in this case uh, Betty numbers are bounded so it could be that there are only finitely many Closed geodesics. Mm. So let me see how ah, maybe we use this result, this result.
Okay, so one question now which remains is uh, how one can get existence results for several closed geodesics for this type of manifolds. And uh, there turns, uh, there's, there's one result by Hingston which shows that uh, if all closed geodesics are unstable, so if all closed geodesics on a compact manifold are hyperbolic, then there are infinitely many so geometrically distinct closed geodesics. Actually, it's an open question whether such metrics exist, where all closed geodesics are hyperbolic. One, one can actually slightly weaken the assumption and then also construct examples. So, for example, if you take a surface like this, of, which has negative curvature, like looks like a pair of pants, such that these are closed geodesics, these boundary curves, and there is a section curvature, the Gauss curvature vanishes, and then you use caps of positive curvature and round them off. So these are geodesics, closed geodesics, where the Gauss curvature is vanishes. So in this sense, it's a so-called parabolic, this equation, uh, case which did not appear. So I then the closed geodesics here which may look like this. Uh, they are all hyperbolic. Yeah? So, so this is an example where all these closed geodesics are hyperbolic and then there are actually infinitely many. Okay, but what's an, another point? Uh, so uh, we can use this formula, use equation star now the question is a single closed geodesic how does a single closed geodesic contribute to this term here and it turns out that uh, this is uh, governed only by the average index. You know? So the contribution to this part. And uh, what one gets is uh, from this equality, if we divide by k and take the limit for k to infinity, equation k, so divide by by k and take the limit for k to infinity, uh, that and then it turns out that this is a topological type, a topological number which we can call b of m. So it's a topological number which is the limit of uh, the alternating sum of Betty numbers up to index k, where we divide by k. So that's a topological number. That's given, and if we estimate this term, this is actually more or less uh, given by the average index of this closed geodesic alpha j. The only thing is uh, there's a certain orientability question, so which governed by this number gamma of j, which is a number which is plus or minus one or plus or minus one half. Well, that actually depends on the parity. So if you, if you consider the sequence index c, j of m, so it somehow controls how the, whether all these numbers are even or odd, which is important since we use alternating sums here. 
Okay, so you have such an equation, such a formula. <coughs> so there's a topological number such that this holds. This is true if uh, the metric is bumpy. So one conclusion, for example, is conclusion. Um, let's see, if uh, on S2, with a bumpy metric, there are two closed geodesics. So two geometrically different closed geodesics. Uh, and okay, how can one see this? Mm. Okay, so uh, the proof would be, so if there are only finitely many, so uh, if there are only finitely many closed geodesics, then by Hinkson's result, we know there is a, there is a non there is a elliptic one, closed geodesic. So this means that the average index which belongs to this uh, elliptic one is irrational. And uh, you count, or this number B of S2 actually is, not or these numbers are always that one can prove that these are always rational numbers. So for S2, it's actually uh, minus one. Um, <coughs> so uh, we immediately see there, there has to be a second closed geodesic. Yeah? Otherwise, this formula cannot be valid. There is a second, which also has to be elliptic closed geodesic. Um, so that's one way of proving the existence of a second closed geodesic. So uh, actually, this statement is also true for fin symmetrics. And for fin symmetrics, there are, do exist examples which only have two closed geodesics on S2. So in this sense, it's sharp. <coughs> There are so called, there are non reversible thin symmetrics with only two closed geodesics. remark. So and that they are obtained by perturbing the standard Riemannian metric as follows. So as a standard Riemannian metric there you know that all geodesics are closed and these are the great circles and in this case what you do you are uh, built in a rotation. So, so uh, if you study the geodesic flow of the standard metric, for example, it means that this vector, so this belongs to a great circle which comes back, so after time 2 pi, uh, this vector is mapped to itself. So it's invariant. So what happens now is that you uh, 
take a rotation, so uh, together with the standard, so with the geodesic flow, you also use the rotation uh, around the z-axis with a certain angle. And so this gives so that after some rotation you come back, but uh, you have a certain angle here. So that's the angle. And if you choose this angle to be 2 pi over or 2 pi uh, times some uh, times alpha and alpha is irrational, then you see that uh, there are no periodic orbits oh, uh, unless uh, the equator. So the equator would be invariant and here you count the equator twice. So since this metric is non-reversible, so the length, if you go around in this direction, is shorter as if you go in the other direction. So in some sense this means that uh, what, what the corresponding Finster metric, it measures the so-called traveling time on this uh, Riemannian manifold under the additional influence of some wind. And the wind here comes uh, is the killing field which belongs to the rotation. So, uh, which means, so you could think of the wind blowing in this direction. So if you sail on this great circle, you will come back uh, with this constant angle. And this, so this cannot be realized as a Riemannian metric, but as a Finster metric. And then you have two closed geodesics, so the equator in this direction or the equator which uh, in this Finster metric is longer since you sail against the wind. Okay, <coughs> so, but I should also remark that at least for S2 there are more, there are there's also a famous result by Lustenink and Schneermann. <coughs> which states uh, uh, on S2 there are three, there are actually three simple closed geodesics. So, which uh, is a stronger result than our result here. Uh, in, but in this case, it's important on S2 with a Riemannian metric. That's only true for Riemannian metric, maybe also for a reversible Finster metric, but definitely not for a non reversible metric. Um, so this is a result from 1929. Actually, the the proof is quite short, and uh, people were not very satisfied with this proof. And there is a number of other proofs appeared later on by Ballmann, Joost, Abrechings, and Taimanov. Uh, in the spirit of the original proof, and later on by now by Grayson. They use, uh, so here's always the problem is uh, the flow, the uh, length decreasing flow on a space of closed curves. <coughs> and uh, so uh, with this uh, mean curvature or mean curvature flow in this particular case, you uh, can uh, you get a very nice proof of this statement. Okay, that's this is uh, this is a result which is certainly strongly restricted to the two-dimensional case. For example, this result on the sec on two closed geodesics has a certain state. Uh, you can also generalize to higher dimensions, but this is strictly two-dimensional result. So here the statement is simple. So simple means uh, simple no self-intersection. And uh, in this, uh, and that's actually sharp. 
this result, uh, one can show that uh, for ellipsoids, which are almost round, uh, there are only the three, the intersections with the coordinate axis are the only three simple closed geodesics. Yeah? So if you have an ellipsoid, you have these three closed geodesics. So if you would take the intersection with the coordinate planes. And uh, for these ellipsoids, you can show that the, if it's almost round, these are the only ones which are simple. You can also show that there are infinitely many closed geodesics, but all other closed geodesics will have self-intersections. There's also another uh, result on the existence of infinitely many closed geodesics, and that's due to, yeah, the first case was solved by Burkhoff in the 20s. Uh, but there, then uh, in maybe 20 years ago, Bangert and Franks solved the remaining cases, and uh, so all this altogether shows on S2 with a Riemannian metric. <coughs> there always exist infinitely many. There always exist infinitely many closed geodesics. And this is uh, actually a combination by methods from dynamical systems and variational methods. <coughs> um, okay. Yeah, so this is around 9.25, this is... Um, okay, and maybe at the end I should state some open questions. So n, so what's the question? So n is the number of closed geodesics. Yeah. Geodesics, and the question would be uh, if m equals Sn and n is at least 3, uh, is n always infinite? Do there always exist infinitely many closed geodesics? So uh, one, what one can prove using these arguments like this, one can prove that uh, for a generic metric there always exist infinitely many closed geodesics. But uh, it's not really clear whether there may be in some sense some isolated metrics with only finitely many closed geodesics. So this is a question for Riemannian metrics, yeah? for Riemannian metrics. And the second question would be, if we take m equals Sn, also n equals n, and uh, a Finster metric. And then the question is, is n always at least 2? There are also partial results exist. For example, for bumpy metric, the, this is 2. And there are also some results. Maybe n equals 3 is solved. There are papers. So maybe, uh, but, uh, okay, but in, it's not clear whether this is really true in all dimensions. So there are still certain questions to be solved. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.